verses 1 through 6. If you're using a pew Bible, that'll be on page 1125. Romans 15, verse 1 through 6. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Amen. Mr. Joel and the words of encouragement that you bring to the reading of the Word of God and sharing from the Word of God. Remember that it's not the clouds around us may be thick, but we focus on Jesus. Thanks for reminding me of that. And thank you, worship team. Every week you bring joy to my heart. You lift up Jesus, and that is the main thing. So I'm so blessed by your work, by your ministry of music, and, and I hear you pray, and you want to serve Jesus. What a joy it is to serve with you. The, <clears throat> and all of you who serve Christ, you serve Christ in many, many ways, and we're thankful for that. There are things that go on that are unseen, and those are certainly appreciated to the glory of Jesus. We are thankful <clears throat> for our ministry continuing. We have uh, Sunday School for Young People uh, in the library, and Al will be teaching, and I'll be leading in chapel, and the focus is on apostasy and God's desire. That's today out of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. The, <clears throat> after we get done with Romans, we're going to do a, a series, a brief series, before we deal with Mark, and then we will come to Jeremiah, the 10 things Jeremiah has for us. We want to do a series called David and, take 8 to 10, I haven't decided yet fully, I've got, uh, David and Goliath, David and uh, Abiathar, David and Mephibosheth, David and Bathsheba, and the redemptive lessons that come from these relationships, we want to take a look at them. <clears throat> Today's focus, Romans 15, 1 through 6. Some of your Bibles may have 7 attached, but um, it would appear that it is best attached to verse 8. So we'll end at verse 6 for this message. Also, <clears throat> beginning, we will open with verses 5 and 6. In these two verses, we have a prayer that comes from the lips of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And in here, there is a key phrase, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we're headed in the message, and we'll be talking about godly worship, the qualities of those who worship truly, and uh, this is in the bond of unity. So this is where we're going. We'll begin with uh, five and six. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you might come, that you might work even now, that the name of Jesus might be lifted up to the glory of God the Father. We pray, O oh God, that you might help us to hear and to do in a culture that cripples us and deafens us. Lord, we, we are people who are given to other treasures other than Jesus. We are given to, <clears throat> we are overcome often by 
the malaise of our world, but let us not live in fear, but live to the glory of Jesus Christ, who is our King. Now, O oh Lord, have at us, strengthen us, use us, and we ask it all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verses 5 and 6, if you will look first at these verses, Paul prays for the church. He has been talking about the strong and the weak. The strong are those who have, <clears throat> who have come to a place in their faith where they do not have to attend to the food laws and they, they don't have to attend to uh, the uh, laws from Judaism um, which have been replaced by the gospel or fulfilled by the gospel. Uh, they are free and they delight in Jesus. Now the weak have faith too and they still want to hold on to some of these rules and regulations and think that the, the strong are actually liberals and the strong are looking at the weak as, as, um, as if they are out of their minds. So you have this conflict within the Roman church and so Paul is addressing this. And he, he begins in verses 1 through 4, give us certain qualities that attend to this. In verse 5, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live, this is the sovereign work of God, in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. So the harmony is always rooted in the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a, a harmony that is built on worldly desires, but is fully entrenched in Christ. Now, <clears throat> that together, now here's, here's our focus, that you may with one voice, one voice, voice spoken, voice that you hear in prayer, song, with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. This is Paul's prayer for the church in Rome. His desire is that they glorify God with one voice. There is our theme, a united voice of worship. Now we know that if we read far enough and read well, we know that not all of our Western churches, not all of them, but many, too many, worship has become big business. That is, <clears throat> professionals, professionals are often employed uh, or paid or just uh, given an opportunity to show or strut their stuff. And uh, these professionals are often given opportunity to conduct worship so that crowds may form. This isn't worship, never has been. True worship happens in any size of church, whether it's five or six or 500, and it happens by means of the Holy Spirit who uses people like this team here today and all of the teams who want to glorify God will use them to bring God's name honor. And that so blesses me, and I know it is an offering to God that is sweet. True worship happens in any size and by the means of God. So today we're going to look at verses 1 through 4, which stand upon this prayer in verses 5 and 6. Verses 1 through 4 rest upon 5 and 6. Paul's prayer in verses 5 and 6, we're going to, we're going to put our feet firmly in, on that foundation and look at verses 1 and 4. So we're going to identify two qualities of a church that must be in place if true worship is to happen. And you'll notice how very often, Old and New Testament, you see this calling the people of God to worship and giving us qualities. Now these aren't the only two, there are many throughout the Word of God, but these are two important qualities that appertain to a church that truly worships. Now again, it is the prayer of Paul. We open with that because it has the theme, with one voice glorify God. Built on top of that, you have these qualities in verses one through four, 
And we're going to shake them out and come up with two this morning. The first one is found in verses 1 through 3. What are the qualities of a church that truly worships? What are the qualities of a church that truly worships? A worshiping church is one that has Christ as model, has Christ as model, M-O-D-E-L, or you could say a pattern, a P-A-T-T-E-R-N, model or pattern. A worshiping church is one that has Christ as model, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Look at this. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Now he goes on, and Paul is talking about the strong, those who have no problem uh, with living a life and eating uh, certain meats and drinking certain things, and, and they have no problem with, with um, living their lives in joy. But there are those that do. They are weak in their faith, and they have a problem with eating certain things, but still they have faith. Paul is saying, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Their faith isn't quite there, and they need to be attended to, not to please ourselves. So Paul drives home this point that the strong, when they relate to the weak, are not to say to themselves, well, my pleasure comes first. No, says Paul. Paul, by the way, puts himself with the strong. He sees himself as a strong believer because he is not going to be held back by the food regulations of the law. These are being fulfilled in Christ. Christ has called all foods clean. So Paul sees himself as strong and he looks to weak. Those are not there yet, but they still have faith. And he says to himself and to those who are also strong, it's not about pleasing ourselves. It's about bearing other people's burdens. Verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Let each of us please his neighbor. Now he's using the word neighbor in the near sense. That is within the body of Christ. It doesn't exclude the lost, but it, it is mainly for the body. The strong, weak relationship. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So those who are strong in the faith, the job within the body is to encourage the weak to build them up. To make them stronger by the work of the Spirit. And that's hard work. So the strong are to come to the aid of the weak and encourage them to grow in Christ. That is their aim. Or it ought to be. Paul is emphasizing. The strong must learn the, letter, the, the great lesson that it is far better to please others so that they might grow in their faith. That's what we must, that's what they must learn. Now look at this. For Christ did not please himself. He didn't. But as it is written, now you would expect that Paul would quote from an experience uh, in G from Jesus' life. No, he doesn't. What he does is he goes to 69.9 of the Psalms. Psalm 69.9. Now you would say, well, why didn't Paul just quote uh, something that Jesus did in his life? Well, he could have. But Paul has a very high view of the Old Testament because the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And Christ is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is redemptive. And I just want to pause for a moment and expose another lie. There's a lie floating around the evangelical world that says that the Old Testament is just for illustration. All it is is just a book of illustrations, and we use it from time to time. And it's, it's a book of moral lessons. Well, that's baloney. Utter and absolute baloney. Paul doesn't see it that way. Look how highly he holds the Old Testament. Look at his view of this word how wonderful he sees it the study of the old and the new imperative so we continue 
Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. The psalmist David is writing that the reproaches made against God fell upon him. Now this is prophecy. It points to Jesus who, and what does this say? Jesus took the scorn that was addressed to the Father. Jesus took upon himself, or he was willing to be scorned for God's honor, and that's his point. Paul is saying Jesus was willing to be scorned, even though he didn't deserve it. He took it on in any case, so that God might be exalted and we might be set free. That is Paul's point. He says, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That is what Christ did. He did not desire for himself. He desired for the glory of God and ultimately for his people, like us sitting here today who trust in him. He took upon himself the reproaches that were directed against God because he always lives for the glory of God. This is Paul's high example or high model or high pattern. The strong are to take this as their example. Now we know in, in the modern world that we don't have, in our church, we don't have weak strong in the sense of uh, food laws. That is to say some engage in food laws and others don't. We don't have that. So we will apply this truth generally to our situations. And one way to do that is simply to say this. We must, as strong believers in particular, who have a mature faith, we must help others in the body who do not. We must, in general, <laughs> now the weak aren't off the hook here too. It's just looking at the relationship of weak too strong. But in general, the application to the body is, let us look to the interests of other people. Let us look to building up other people and not look to our own passions. A worshiping church is one wherein Christ is the model for us or our pattern. We want to be like him in that we desire to build up other people and not to attend to our own passions. The strong are particularly to be involved in this with respect to those who are not yet mature in their faith. So it has general application. Yes, strong to weak, not in the same sense as it was here, but in the sense of maturity and lack of, but also everyone is accountable here too to build up others even at the expense of ourselves, not attending to our own pleasures, but attending to building up others. Our lives are to be given to bear the burdens of, uh, of others for their benefit and for the glory of God. This is the model of Christ. He is our pattern. We say in summary then, a worshiping church is one that has Christ as model, as pattern. Why? Because he did not attend to himself. He attended to the glory of God and to the benefit of people like us who profess his name. That's what he did. He chose to build up and not to attend to his own pleasures. And that is, the, that is what Paul is driving at in a nutshell. A worshiping church is one that has Christ as its model. Now here's an illustration. Many of you sew. You go and you buy fabric and you take it home. And as my wife tells me, sometimes you have to wash it. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe you'd iron it or something. And then you buy a pattern. And it's, I don't know, it's a, a parka from Canada or something you want to make. And you take your pattern, it's that thin paper. I've never made anything. 
to my own shame, I haven't. I didn't even make this shirt. It looks like it, but I didn't. And, and what you do is you spread out this thin pattern over your fabric, and then you pin it, and then you start cutting it out, right? Isn't that so? And then once you get all the pieces out, then you sew them together, and then you should have a garment that looks half decent or like the picture. Well, consider this. Each day, a believer should carefully place the pattern of Christ over the fabric of our lives, wrinkled though it is. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to cut off that which is not necessary. Christ is our pattern. We chop off those things that distract us or that would say to us, your treasure is something like pleasure number one, two, or three instead of Jesus. When we place the pattern of Christ on our life and begin to cut it out so that it fits by the power of the Holy Spirit, cut out so that we fit Christ, not perfectly at this point, when we see him, then we shall be perfect. But when we place his pattern on, his, on our lives and cut it out, that which should not be there is gone and will not affect us and take us away from the truth that we are called to please others, the strong to the weak, and even strong and weak. We are called to build up others, not to seek out our own pleasures. That was Christ and is Christ. And it must be our model. Every day, place the pattern by the Holy Spirit place that pattern that is Christ upon our lives and cut off that which is not necessary because it will distract us from our purpose. Carefully and prayerfully place his pattern on our lives. Then by the power of the Holy Spirit cut and fit and then our garments will be those that will draw the attention of God instead of of turn him oh, of turning him away a life given to the honor of God is a life given to worship the Holy Spirit oh God help us Spirit of God to look more and more day by day like Jesus place the pattern on my life oh God and cut off that which is not necessary some things to consider on this point before we come to the table. Are we the kinds of people who place our lives on the word of God and cut off the word that doesn't fit us? Do we want our pleasures first and God secondarily? Do we place our lives on the word and cut off so that we feel better? Ah. <sighs> Now I feel better. Yes, yes, O oh God, you are calling me to imbibe in my pleasure. That is our culture. We are a pleasure-saturated world. Oh, yes, I'm so glad that I've now found in the Bible uh, that these verses don't apply to me anymore, that I can just imbibe in my pleasure, and who gives a hoot about anybody else? Uh, am I that kind of person? I must say that there are days, yes. I hope that that is dying increasingly. That is why the table is so necessary for people like me to be reminded of the pattern of the suffering servant. Are our pleasures and needs more important than service to others? When we come to worship, are we more concerned with being entertained or praising God? People who truly worship are people who have increasingly Christ as their pattern. And by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that pattern is impressed daily, 
moment by moment upon the fabric of our lives and that which is not important is cut off that which shouldn't be in the picture is gone so that I might glorify God if you are mature then seek to encourage the immature and both mature and immature let us seek to help one another not desiring to build to grasp our own pleasures but to release them so as we might help other people to grow in Christ and yet there is another answer here a worshiping church is one that has Christ as model but a worshiping church is one that has word as motivator has word as motivator listen to this verse verse 4 for whatever was written in former days in the Old Testament that is in the days of Isaiah was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragements of the scriptures we might have hope given the shortness of time I'm just going to squeeze this together a worshiping church is one that has Christ as model and word as motivator that is to say the Old Testament was written and these two words are to be taken together some try to separate them off, that might be so, but the, the Greek seems to favor this. That through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And that's eternal hope, the coming of Christ, the establishment of the kingdom, our eternal life with him, that hope. But it is when we read the word of God... Our endurance and our strength increases and our encouragement increases. That is our comfort in the midst of trial increases. Believers receive endurance or strength, encouragement or comfort from the word to continue in a life that honors God. The purpose of the scriptures is that believers should have hope. Hope is generated by carefully reading, understanding, studying, and applying the very Word of God. What this is talking about is that a believer or believers who want to worship God must be soaked in the Word of God. Soaked. Now, I was reading, as I am wont to do, here and there, and I know you, you guys love to read too. And I found this, this is a re recipe on Torah truths. Since we're talking about food laws, I thought it might be interesting to see what's going on. Uh, Passover lamb recipe, there's a Passover lamb recipe, and since I like crock pot cooking, and some of you probably don't like crock pot cooking, but if you want help with crock pot cooking, just ask me, I can help you. There's one called Passover lamb recipe. And one aspect of the Passover lamb recipe is intriguing. They say to take the uh, lamb that is to be roasted and you soak it for a season so that the impurities come out. Isn't that interesting? You soak it in this, this solution that is identified here. And, and you, you soak it there so that the impurities fall out of the meat. Makes sense. And then you, you do what else you have to do. And you prepare before cooking. And then you're off to the races. In the Christian life, what the Word of God does when we read it, when we study it, when we pray it, when we think about it, when we go about our day and ponder the Word of God, when we memorize it, when we hide it in our hearts, when we do this, as Paul is, is saying here, we, when we're soaked in it, it tends to remove impurities, if I may say, such that when we come to worship, we are thinking about Christ and verses come to mind. When, 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 the, uh, when the PowerPoint comes up, there's a picture. And I'm uh, seeing pictures and sometimes verses will come to mind. Ever had that happen? And, and the, the, the team is singing and they'll reference a verse. And that 
brings up another picture in your minds and hearts. When we come to worship, let our hearts be saturated with the Word of God. If this is so, then we will see a sweetness growing in our lives. So a church that truly worships is one that is saturated in the Word of God. That is, one that has the Word of God as motivator. Impurities are removed and our lives are stimulated. We are refreshed and we are stimulated to service, stimulated to meet God. That's what's going on when you're soaked in the Word of God. Impurities taken out and you're refreshed and ready to worship and ready to serve. That's what happens. So consider this. Is the reading and studying of the Word increasingly important in my life? I mean, really, are we studying the Word, reading the Word, thinking about the Word, memorizing as best as we can the Word of God? How long am I soaked in the Word each week? Are impurities largely removed by the time we reach corporate worship on Sunday morning? Impurities removed here is the struggle we live in a cesspool in the west it is best that we rise out we have to wade through it but it is best that we climb up we get out of it we wash in the word those times that we wade we wade because we must and we do to the glory of God, but then we get to high ground, we dry, we wash, we clean ourselves with the word of God. Encouragement, endurance, then comes harmony, then comes worship. So, a worshiping church is one that has Christ as model and word as motivator. The word cleanses and refreshes and gets us ready for service so that we want to go on. So we come to the table, which is the central part of our overall worship experience. Whether we do it every week or not, this still is it. We gather around the table, we remember Jesus, and we say, come Lord Jesus. If, oh Lord, come. Come. Honestly, is Christ my model and is the word my motivator? What if there is no desire to glorify God? What if this table means nothing? Perhaps there is no Jesus. To the Christian we say, let us eat now and delight in this wonderful, wonderful table. Let's delight in it. God, help me. Give to me the attitude of worship. Christ is model. Word is motivator. Soak me. Impress me with your pattern, O oh Jesus. But if you're not a believer, and the Holy Spirit is revealing that right now, don't partake of the table. And if you're living in sin, don't partake of the table. It's dangerous. But if you do not know Christ, here is your way. Repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Turn away from a life of sin and trust in him who died and rose. It is then, and only then, that you can worship God. Now we come. Now we come. The table of the Lord, the next book over from Romans, turn to chapter 11. Here is 